Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about gas discharge tube based electronic components like Nixie tubes, voltage regulator tubes, neon tubes or well transient protection elements. I want to look at the basic operating principle as well as the various properties and parameters that characterize such a component. And then look at how something like this can be modeled in a circuit simulator. LT Spice of course. So if you're curious, then keep watching. Now, what are gas discharge components? And what are they useful for? Well, you will find these under various names, but basically it's some sort of an enclosure with some sort of gas in it, with a couple electrodes, and when you apply sufficiently high voltage, the gas gets ionized, and usually it also emits light. Now, the most common type you might be familiar with is the neon tube, used for lighting. So one use case is the generation of light. But there are other utilities also. In things like Nixie tubes, which are obsolete but still really cool, you get a data display function, so you get this with various numbers or symbols, but also you get simple binary 0-1 variants. Now, another interesting but obsolete function is that of voltage stabilizer. So before Zener diodes were a common place, you could use gas tubes as voltage references. And finally, a still common use case is that of transient protection element, so to protect circuits from various high voltage pulses. Now, from a construction and operating principle point of view, all of these components are built and function in roughly the same way. So you need two electrodes placed inside of an enclosure that is filled with some sort of gas mixture, and this gas mixture is normally non-conductive from an electrical point of view, but if you apply a large enough voltage potential to the electrodes, the gas gets ionized and starts conducting electricity. Now, based on the physical dimension and construction, so the distance between the electrodes, their size, their coating, as well as the properties of the gas, so its exact mixture and its pressure, you can set the various voltages and currents to which the component will react and how it will handle them. Now, from a basic operating principle point of view, a gas discharge tube will not conduct current at low voltages, so if you apply voltage to it, you can increase the voltage and little to no current will pass through it until you reach a certain threshold, so this is called an ignition threshold or a turn-on threshold, after which the gas inside ionizes, so the current abruptly rises and while well, the voltage on the tube drops and then if you further increase the voltage then of course the current will also rise. Now the voltage at which you ionize the tube is higher than the voltage at which you can maintain the ionization so this curve somewhat looks like a semiconductor diac. So this phenomenon does not really depend on the voltage polarity. You can operate such a tube with either a positive or a negative voltage. That being said, depending on the way the component is constructed, so if the two electrodes are not perfectly symmetrical, maybe one has a different size than the other, maybe it has a different coating, in this case, some components are built to have specific polarities applied to them, and that will cause them to have different voltage current curves depending on the polarity which is applied to them. So now, let's see how such a component works. For today's experiments, I will be using an STR85-10 voltage stabilizer tube, but any such component would behave similarly. So the first setup that I prepared involves using a 50 Hz sine wave that has a peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of 660 volts, so roughly 330 on each polarity, and I'm passing this through a resistor to my voltage stabilizer tube. So on the blue channel I'm measuring the input voltage, and on the yellow channel I'm measuring the voltage present on the tube. So the first behavior to observe is that the voltage on the tube, let's just magnify things a bit, is that the voltage on the tube follows the input voltage almost exactly up until a specific point where the tube ignites and then it proceeds to stabilize the voltage even if the input voltage is continuously increasing. So at low voltages the tube is acting like an isolator there's no current passing through it or only very little current, but after it starts conducting, it maintains quite a constant voltage drop. Now, since this is a voltage regulator tube, 
it has a preferred polarity, so the datasheet defines a specific anode and a cathode. But regardless, if we zoom out a bit, we can see that the tube is getting ionized both on the positive and on the negative polarities. So we get the same behavior in both cases. It's just that when you apply a negative voltage, the behavior is less controlled. So we see that the tube after a certain point ignites, but then the voltage on it is not that well maintained. So the same basic phenomenon appears regardless of what polarity you're applying. So to simulate this component's behavior, LTSPICE already has a built-in component, which is the parametri... which is the parametri... paramet... param... the neon bulb. And it's found under the MISC category. So this is a symmetrical discharge tube, polarity doesn't matter. And to characterize it, we can right-click it and see the various parameters that describe this component's behavior. So let's just make all of these visible and we'll go through them one by one. So if we want to reproduce our experiment, the first thing to set is the strike and hold voltage. So for our particular tube, we can quite easily find a datasheet for it, so the STR8510. And now, I don't speak any German, but this UZ is the strike voltage and the UB is the maintaining voltage. And now there are some observations here, but I don't know what they're saying, but you gotta trust me on this. So if we now insert here 125 for the strike, 85 for the hold, we'll get to the other parameters soon enough. And we run the simulation. So we have a sine wave plus minus 310 volts running through 100 kilo ohms. And if we check the voltage on the tube, we see a similar wave shape to what we've seen in our experiment. So we can also check the current and maybe add another plot plane. So we can see that the current through the tube stays zero, so LD spice is giving us a nanoamp value, and then when a certain voltage threshold is reached, current suddenly shoots up to a certain value, and we can see that the voltage on the tube drops, and then is maintained fairly constantly. So you can see here that the voltage is around 87, going up to about 89 volts. So this is quite a similar behavior to what we've seen in reality. With one particular difference, which is that we were much closer to the 85 volts that we were supposed to have than the 87 that we're getting in the simulation. So to fix that, we have another parameter that we need to set, which is this Z on parameter. So the gas discharge tube works like a voltage source with some internal impedance, so some sort of series resistance. And if we check the data sheet, for this particular tube, we actually have it, so we have our internal resistance of about 250 ohms. This is not always specified for every single tube, but this is a value with which you can determine how the voltage on the tube will increase with increasing current. So if we now go back to our simulation, set our Z on to 250, rerun the simulation, now we can see that our maintaining voltage is much, much closer to what we should be getting, so it's between 85 and 85.5. But we can still see that our striking voltage, so the voltage at which the tube turns on, is around 133 volts. So it's just a bit over the 125 that we should be getting. But we'll get to this in a little while. Now, if we focus a bit on the ramp down of the sine wave, we'll notice an interesting phenomenon. So the tube is maintaining its output voltage, fairly constant, but this voltage isn't maintained until the input voltage reaches this point, but rather, a bit before that, we can see that the voltage on the tube has a slight rise. So the tube stops conducting before the supply voltage reaches the stabilization voltage. So to understand what's going on, why the voltage on the tube suddenly rises, it's important to remember that the default state of the gas inside of the tube is non-conducting. You need to apply energy to it to ionize it and to get it, well, ionized. And this energy, that is, given to the gas, is coming from the current passing through the tube. So to keep the tube ionized, you don't just need to have a specific voltage applied to it, you also need a specific minimum current passing through it. Otherwise, the ionization cannot be maintained. So when our supply voltage is dropping, because this supply voltage is going through a resistor, and as the supply voltage is getting closer to the voltage present on the tube, the current passing through the tube is dropping. So after this minimum current point is reached, the tube switches off, 
and we see a small rise in the voltage present on the tube. Now, we also have a parameter to characterize this behavior in the model. It comes in the form of the I hold parameter, so the hold current. And for this particular tube, if we check the datasheet again, we can see that we have a maximum and a minimum current. But this minimum current is not necessarily the minimum hold current, but rather is the current at which the tube will still stay within the regulation parameters that are guaranteed by the datasheet. So in real life, this current will be slightly smaller. So if we rerun the simulation again, and we check the voltage on the tube, so as we've seen previously, we have this drop in voltage when the tube ignites. But if we look here, we can see that as the tube turns off, we also have the jump in voltage. So we can also check the current running through the tube. We can see that the current goes from some value, so 100 micro, dropping down to zero. So again, we're not at the value that we were supposed to be getting, which is 200 microamps, we're at 100 microamps, but this discrepancy has to do with the final parameter found in the model. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. Now, playing around with this maintaining current, it's important to observe what happens when you use a very large resistor. So right now, I have the same circuit, but the series resistor is a 2.2 megaohm resistor. So now, if we look at the voltage on the tube, we see that it looks slightly different. So let's just zoom in a bit. And what we see here is that as the voltage rises, so the applied voltage to the tube rises, at some point the tube starts conducting, but because of the large value of the resistor, the current passing through the tube is causing a large voltage drop on the resistor, so the current cannot be maintained. Therefore, the tube switches off, so the voltage rises again. And this phenomenon continues, and we see this nice oscillation appearing. So unless you're applying enough current to the tube once it ignites, it cannot maintain its ignition status, so it runs into this oscillation phenomenon. Now, this effect can be enhanced by adding a capacitor in parallel with the tube, and thus creating a nice and very basic oscillator. Now, the process by which the gas gets ionized is known as the Townsend effect or Townsend avalanche. So for this, you've got your gas in your enclosure, you apply a voltage potential, and you need an initial ionization event, so you need some ionizing radiation. This initial ion will start moving towards the negative terminal, but the lighter electron that was liberated starts moving up towards the positive terminal, and in turn, it's other gas molecules, which are also ionized, so more electrons get created, and well, the whole thing turns into an avalanche moving towards the positive terminal. Now, other than electrons being created during these interactions, you also get high energy photons, so UV light. And this UV light can also ionize other gas molecules. So other than these initial electrons, you also get some light, which further creates new initial ions, so eventually the entire gas can get ionized if you maintain your electric field for a sufficient amount of time. So it's important to observe that this phenomenon is not instantaneous. So once you apply your voltage potential to your gas, you need your initial event to happen at some point, this needs to spiral out of control, and it needs to ionize the entire gas. So it takes the time it takes. Now, depending on the application, so for example, for Nixie tubes or indicator tubes, lighting tubes, the time it takes to light up the tube doesn't really matter. I mean, if it's a microsecond or a millisecond, it's the same thing. But for other applications, for example, transient protection elements, well, you need a protection element to kick in at some point. So for that sort of component, this avalanche time is a critical parameter. There's no point in having a protection element that doesn't start working until your circuit broke. Now, to highlight this effect, I prepared the basic high side high voltage switch to be able to generate very steep turn on and turn off slopes to supply the tube. So the schematic for this thing we can see here, it's quite a basic circuit. We got our input signal driving a low side transistor, which in turn drives a high side MOSFET. This has a protection sinner and well, a fast discharge circuit. And then this goes out to the output to supply our tube. Now this is built almost exactly like you would build any high side switch. It's just that I used some high voltage components for this. 
So the low side transistor and the high side MOSFET are both rated for at least 300 volts. So now I got my power supply, the DC output of it, connected to the switch, which then supplies the circuit. And the switch is also driven by the signal generator, which is off screen. So first off, I'm applying a one millisecond long pulse. So we have 100 microseconds per division here. And one pulse appears every one second. And we can see that even though we're applying 160 volts, so more than the tube needs to ignite, the voltage on the tube in yellow doesn't reach the stabilization plateau instantly. So even though we are applying sufficient voltage, the ionization process doesn't appear until a certain amount of time passes. So depending on multiple factors, there is a certain time needed for the ionization to occur. So one of these factors being, well, random, when does the first ion appear? So we can see that even though we're applying the exact same pulse with every single time and the interval between pulses is the same, the ionization process is not appearing after the same amount of time. So sometimes it takes more than a millisecond, sometimes it's done in about 100 microseconds. Now, another parameter on which this time period depends on is the applied voltage. So if I now proceed to increase the voltage, so go to about 200 volts, we see the same phenomenon still appearing, but this time the period is far shorter. So the higher the voltage that you're applying to the tube, the faster the ionization can occur. Now, if we just come back a bit, say go to about 200 volts, and we change another parameter, which is the time between the pulses. So right now, as I said, we have one millisecond pulses every second, but if we decrease the time even more, so have one millisecond pulse every 10 milliseconds, we can see that this period is much, much shorter this time. So if you don't allow enough time in between the pulses, the initial ions that appeared in the first ionization process don't have enough time to completely disappear. So the next time that you apply enough voltage, it takes a much shorter amount of time to reionize the gas. So just like it takes a certain amount of time to ionize the gas, it takes a certain amount of time to deionize it. So it doesn't instantly revert to its natural state. Now to test this behavior out in the simulator, I modeled the switch circuit and I added our tube model as well as two different supply voltages, so 300 volts and 200 volts. Now if we run the circuit and check the two responses, so we can see that our basic model correctly shows that the higher the voltage that you apply, the faster the tube will turn on, but we don't get the randomness that we see in real life, and we also don't see the deionization process. Regardless, for the very first time that ionization occurs, this model is sufficiently accurate. And now, speaking of ionization, the final parameter in the model is a time constant that determines how quickly the tube can ionize and deionize. So this is the tau parameter, which is found in the model, and the default value is set to 200 microseconds. And to see its effect, we can change it to 20 on just one of the circuits, and on the other set the same supply voltage. So both of them have 300 volts, but now one of them has a 20 microsecond time constant and the other one has a 200 microsecond. Let's also bring up the supply voltage. So this is the same in both cases, but the tube in green, the one with the 20 microsecond time constant is much quicker to react both on the turn on and on the turn off. Whereas the tube with the 200 microsecond time constant is much slower. So it's slower at turning on and it's slower at turning off. So this parameter is the reason why we were not getting our tube to react exactly to the thresholds that we set in the model. So when the supply voltage was rising, after it hit 125 volts set in the model, we had to wait for the time constant and only then did the tube turn on, so that's why we were getting 130 something. And the same thing when the tube was turning off, after the current running through the tube passed below 200 microamps, we still had to wait for the time constant until the tube actually switched off. So that's why we're getting only 100 microamps. So by fine-tuning this parameter, you can fine-tune the speed at which the tube in the simulation reacts. Now, especially for transient protection elements, you have far more complex simulation models available from the various manufacturers, but I'll be looking at that in more detail a different time. 
Regardless, the basic model that is present in LT Spice should suffice for most needs, since it covers most of the basic behaviors and properties. Now, in case you're working with any form of gas discharge tube, modeling it and simulating the circuit can be quite a valuable tool to identify potential issues. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.